Okay, we will go ahead and get started. Um, all right. Get stuff over here. All right, so I said, all right, so last time we did lumped capacitance method. Can we see the dog? <laughs> oh, I'm sure the dog, will, maybe the dog will make an appearance. I'll open the door. I doubt she'll come in. She doesn't like it. It's like a little bit warmer in here. Leela! Nope. No dog. <laughs> yeah. I like it when she's nearby as well, but alas. All right. So lumped capacitance assumes that the temperature is not changing uh, with respect to position. So, right. Yeah, if anybody else wants to show their pets, I love that. <laughs> All right, so transient heat transfer. All right, so we talked about talked about if temperature is only a function of time and not position, um, then uh, what do we say? We say lumped capacitance. All right, um, and this is only if our be it number is less, uh, yeah, less than 0.1. But if it's greater than 0.1, then we have to take into consideration spatial effects. So, okay. So if our be it number is greater than 0 0.1, then our temperature is a function of position and time um, and we're just going to work with Cartesian coordinates today and then tomorrow we'll talk with uh, about transient conduction with radial uh, coordinates um, or cylindrical coordinates rather so the way that if you watch the video the way that we derive these equations if we have to take into consideration um, spatial effects we apply our heat diffusion equation Perfect. All right, so then all I've got left of that heat diffusion equation, I don't really have that much, but I do have the portion that's um, the time to or the uh, position dependence and then the spatial dependence or the um, time dependence as well. So there we go. So time dependence in orange, spatial dependence in green. Um, and to solve this guy, we're going to need two boundary conditions and then one initial condition. And our initial condition, um, and let's just kind of look at, maybe it would be really nice if we actually talked about the, the system that we're talking about, that we would have um, a plane wall, right? Here's, and it's a thickness of 2L, and then we set it up so that we have um, zero as the, you know, as as the as the origin of the x-axis um, and then we expose it to convection so initially that initial temperature is at some ti and so that's our initial condition so our initial condition actually i want to write it down here our initial condition is that t all throughout x right at whatever position x is right all throughout the medium um, and some and t equals zero um, that's going to be equal to some uniform ti okay and then we'll need a couple of boundary conditions so the boundary conditions are going to tell us what's going on at the boundary. So initially, it's all at some uniform TI, temperature TI, and then we flip a switch and we expose it to convection. And so because we've got symmetrical boundary conditions, right, we've got the same convection on either side, um, we can take advantage of thermal symmetry and we can say, well, there's no 
uh, conduction right at x equals zero. So negative k dt dx right at x equals zero is just going to be zero. Um, and then the the other one, the other boundary condition would be just at x equals l. We've have got convection um, at x equals l. So I'd have you stop that. So I'd have negative k dt dx at x equals l. All right, um, and then that would be equal to well Newton's law. So that and this is I'm writing it in terms of heat flux. So it'll be H times and it'll be T at X equals L minus T infinity. Um, and if you watch the video, what will in, what we end up doing um, is we end up we end up replacing that those temperatures with um, uh, a non-dimensionalized temperature. So we use this and actually it's right down here. This guy right here. So this is on your equation sheet. Um, so we replace the temperatures with non-dimensionalized okay and that makes the math easier presumably makes the math easier um, for someone someone that came in and solved this differential equation with those two boundary conditions and that initial condition. Um, and they, they did solve it and it's this guy right here. So let's kind of look at it real quick. So what we have, we've got our non-dimensionalized temperature profile. So it's this theta star. Um, so you've got the theta star So it's our theta star here, and this is equal to the temperature at whatever particular um, whatever particular position and time that we're interested in. And then, of course, we've got a T infinity and a T initial, and those things are self-explanatory. All right, so that's that's this guy, um, and then we have this series solution. So this guy right here the cn this is just a constant of integration so when we you know when we integrate these these um we when we integrate our differential equation we'll have um well we'll have three constants of integration i believe um and so our cn is sort of all of those constants of integration lumped into one that's what that is so it's just a constant um and then this guy right here, this is our time dependence portion of that, um, that uh, theta star, of that temperature profile. So what you have, you've got this zeta in, right, because it's a series solution, right? So you have, you know, term one, two, three, four, all the way up to n. So you have zeta in and it's squared, and then you've got the Fourier number. So the Fourier number is a dimensionless parameter, and I'm gonna look at it. Uh, actually, it's on our, I don't have it on that little section, but I do have it on our packet, and it's right here. So this is on that first page of your heat transfer packet. So your Fourier law, uh, Fourier law, your Fourier number is a dimensionless time dimensionless time that's what it is so this is a dimensionless time we had a dimensionless temperature we have a dimensionless time and we talked about um uh, we talked about how uh, on the on the video that you would have watched before before today hopefully um why we non-dimensionalize things right we do that to sort of uh 
scale up solutions, uh, avoid round off errors, um, uh, and also to be able to sort of look at look at trends about how certain parameters affect maybe the temperature distribution or something that we're interested in. But anyway, so that's our dimensionless time. And all right, so that's that guy. And now, oops, okay. Now we have this guy, oops, that, this guy. So this is our spatial dependence portion. So you've also got this Zeta, we'll talk about him in a second. And then you've got this X star um, and the X star is defined right here. So X star is X, whatever position you're looking at over L. So that X star is a dimensionless position, right? Um, so it goes anywhere from zero to one, right? It's gonna be zero at the midline and it'll be one uh, right, at the, uh, right at the surface, right at X equals L. Okay, if you remember from Calc 2, when you have series solutions, the most important term is gonna be the first one. And then every other subsequent term will be of decreasing importance. Like, so your biggest number is gonna be that first one, and then you'll have like ones that are less important. So when can you ignore everything except that first one because that's what we're going to do we're just going to say you know let's just take the first term in that series we will say okay well if our Fourier number if it's greater than 0 0.2 we will only use that first term and you can see that it's there, there's a little note there um, it's it's under the Heisler charts which we'll get to but you know just I guess so yeah so greater than Fourier number of uh, 0.2 so let's think about why that would make a difference um, so the Fourier number is the dimensionless time um, if you're at that early, those early stages where, okay, there's my, there's my wall. It's initially at some temperature TI, and then all of a sudden I flip the switch and shoom, I expose it to convection. If you're at those early time intervals, there's going to be a lot of change. And to capture all of that change, you want to include more terms in that series solution. So not just not just the first one of that of that series but you'll need to to do multiple um, for our purposes all of the problems that we are going to do i believe have fourier numbers that are greater than 0.2 but it's just something to kind of keep in mind okay so let's look at the terms again in that series solution so you've got your cn and you've got a way to calculate it for whatever n it is right N equals one equals two if you decide to or if your Fourier number was less than 0.2 you you'd need to have more terms so you might need to calculate a C2 um, but you really don't I put it on there but you probably are not going to need to actually calculate it if you scroll down to table 5.1 on your equation sheet which is pretty I don't know it's like the third page or something like that fourth page um, you'll see that you can look those guys up. So all you need to do, we're going to do plain walls today. All you need to do is calculate your B at number and then read off the corresponding Zeta and C1 and plug it in and then it's good. Okay. Um, so you have that equation, those equations, and those are perfectly okay to use. Um, but we also have something called the Heisler charts. Um, so these are, make sure I've got the right, oh shoot, oh, that's for a radius, don't want a radius, I did the wrong one, hold on, there it is, I want to be able to
There we go. All right. So if you scroll, if you look all the way towards the, at the end of your heat transfer packet, you'll see it's at the very end, Heisler chart. So on page 40, I guess. Um, and there are two pages of this. Um, you can use them if you want. I will walk through problems solving it by using the equations, but I'll also show how you would solve it using those Heisler charts. Um, so it's up to you. If you do choose to, if you decide, you know what, I actually like the Heisler charts, seem pretty easy, intuitive, great, use them. Um, and you can use them for the test. But what I will ask you to do is, if you plan on using them, go ahead and print out a copy. Um, and that way you can mark it up. So mark it up and scan that in with the rest of your test work. So I'll repeat that. If you decide to use the Heisler charts on your exam, print out a copy beforehand. You could print out both the, the there's two pages. Go ahead and print out both pages. Um, you should have only one problem where you're going to have to do, you'd have to use them. So you don't need to print out multiple copies, but just, just a copy of the radial and the um, um, plain wall one. So the last two pages of your heat transfer packet, print them out mark them up like we're going to do in class and then scan all that in with your work because it's a lot easier for me to um, like look at your marked up thing and you know if you get it wrong well if I could give you partial credit I want to give you partial credit but I can't really give partial credit for something that well I got this number off the table okay, well, it doesn't mean anything to me so help me to help you to earn all the points that you can for that, um, for taking, uh, like printing out the charts, if for some reason I am the kind of person that likes that, I know um, when I had you for Thermo 2, there was the psychometric charts, and those we had to do in um, English and standard, or um, English and like metric. Uh huh. Um, is this going to be a case? I know you mentioned both um, Cartesian and radial. Yes, so there should just be two pages to print out. All of the, um, there's there, there won't be any, it's it's all non-dimensionalized parameters, so you don't have to worry about units or anything. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, yep. Okay, perfect. All right, so here we go. So the ones that we're going to use today, and we'll, we'll work with them today, so it's 5S1. 5s2 and 5s3 these guys over here we won't use yet those are for heat exchangers so just those three um i will say that uh you'll have to look at it but like i'm gonna zoom in on 5s2 in particular you'll see that it's it's not a logarithmic scale or it's not a logarithmic, it is a logarithmic scale. It's not a linear scale, it's a logarithmic scale. Um, so there's there's a little bit of a trick to reading those. Um, and but we'll 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 practice that if you know if you need a little bit of a review. Okay, so let's just start start working our problems here. All right, so we have annealing is a process by which steel is reheated and then cool to make it less brittle. So, perfect. Okay, so I am going to draw the slab. Do, 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 do. There's my x equals zero. There's zero. Here's L. Here's negative L. Consider the reheat stage for a 100 millimeter thick steel plate. So it's 100 millimeters in total. So L would be 50 millimeters. 0 0.05 meters. Um, and then we've got, well, we've got some parameters up here. I won't write them down again, but we've got row, specific heat, um, we've got K, um, it's initially, this thing is initially at a temperature, 
of 200 degrees Celsius. It's going to be, it's got to be heated to a minimum temperature of 550 degrees Celsius. Um, heating occurs in a gas fired furnace where products of combustion are at 800 degrees Celsius. And then we have a convective coefficient of 250. Okay. Go, go. My cats are annoying. All right, 250 watts per meter squared Kelvin. And we want to know how long should the plate be left in the furnace? So, okay. So we want to find, I'll put this kind of in purple. So we want the time when we've at least, uh, the, there's no part of that medium that's less than 550 degrees Celsius. So before I write what I'm going to find, I'm going to sort of skip ahead for just a hot second. Um, and I'm going to check and see, can I ignore spatial effects? Probably not, since this whole lecture is dedicated to considering them. But it never hurts to check, because then my math would be a lot easier, wouldn't it? So that's number one. So check our be it number. All right, so my be it number is HLC over K. Um, I have L, LC is just the point zero 0.05. So this is going to be 250 watts per meter squared Kelvin times LC 0 0.05 meters divided by our K and our K was 48. 48 watts per meter Kelvin. Um, and I end up getting a value of 0 0.26. So, yeah, I can't ignore it. So my temperature, oops, my temperature is going to be a function. Oops. Temperature is going to be a function of not only time, but position as well. All right. So maybe I put that up here as well. So can you write why we can't ignore it? Sure. And it's because our be it number is greater greater than or equal to 0 0.1. Because remember, 0 0.1 was the, the, the cutoff. If it had been less than 0.1, perfect. I could just use my lumped capacitance method. And it would be a little bit easier. So I wanted to kind of wait a second before I wrote what I'm looking for in find. Because now I have to think about, well... Where in the medium, where in that plate, uh, plane wall, would I be looking at the minimum temperature? So it's starting out at 200 degrees, and then I'm heating it up because I'm exposing it to 800 degrees. Um, and the minimum temperature that I need everything to be at is 550. And the last place in there to heat up is going to be clearly right at x equals zero. So the time that I'm interested. How long should it be left in the furnace for the minimum temperature to be reached is going to be the time when T at X equals zero. I'll put a little T kind of purple there. When that is equal to 550 degrees Celsius, so the minimum temperature. Perfect. All right, so I've checked the be it number, great. Um, now I need to, well, I need to look at my equation sheet, don't I? Um, so my equation sheet has the equation that I need to use. Um, I am just gonna use one term. Now I don't actually know, remember that I can use one term if my Fourier number is greater than 0.1, or uh, greater than 0.2, and I don't have enough information to calculate that Fourier number. 
because I don't know the time, right? I'm looking for the time. I don't know the time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to assume my Fourier number is greater than 0 0.2. Again, your Fourier number, um, so it's the thermal, diff, uh, thermal diffusivity times the time um, over LC squared. To think about it for a second. And that's on your equation sheet. And since I don't know that time, remember that's that's the thing I'm looking for. Since I don't know that, I can't I can't make that call. However, what I can do is I can solve things and then I can, you know, when I finally when I when I find things based on that assumption, I could say, okay, well, was the Fourier number greater than 0.2? If so, okay, probably okay. It's kind of cyclical uh, reasoning, but right because you're you're making an assumption, you're calculating things based on that assumption, and then you're taking what you calculated and using that to see if that assumption was okay in the first place. But it's the best that we've got as long as we're we're pretty pretty far above that point too. We should be okay. All right, so right off my equation sheet, I'm using this guy right here. So I have theta star and my theta star is T. Um, T at uh, um, at X equals zero and this particular time that I'm interested in minus T infinity over T initial minus T infinity. All right, great. Going to plug some numbers in. So I have 550. I have 800. And then 200, right? Yep, 200 degrees Celsius minus 800 degrees Celsius. All right. Um, I end up getting a value of 0 0.4166. Perfect. And then I know that that 0.4166 is also equal to my series solution. Um, so I do need to figure out, I'll write it down, but this is, so it's going to be C1 times E, and then we'll have a to the negative theta 1 squared times our Fourier number. Okay, and then I'll have my cosine times our zeta 1 times that theta, uh, times that x star. Okay. All right, so I do need to get some, get some values for that. Um, I'm going to go ahead and plug in um, that this whole thing was 0.4166 on the left hand side. So 0 0.4166. So all of this is equal to that. All right. I remember my be it, oops. My be it number is 0.26. So I'm going to use that information uh, to look at table 5.1 and just pull things off. So 0.26. What is that x raised to? It's not raised to anything. It's a dimensionless, uh, dimensionless parameter. It's x over l. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, so 0.26. That looks like we're going to be looking between those guys. And so I'm just interpolating. So you probably get something a little bit closer for zeta, closer to 0.52 than 0.48. Um, let's see. I've got, uh, oh, I'm sorry, opposite because it's 0.26. I'm so sorry, 0.26. You'll get something closer to 0.48 than 0.52. Um, and I've got a zeta of 0.488 and a C1 of 1.0396. So, all right. So let's just write down some stuff here now. All right, so C1. C1 I interpolated to be 1.0396. Oops. 
1.0396E to the negative, and then my zeta 1 was uh, 0.4, it's gone now, <laughs> 0 0.488, 0.488. This guy is squared, and then it's going to be times that Fourier number. So remember this whole thing right there, that is our time dependence portion. And then we have our the other portion that's uh, dealing with the position. So since we're talking about the midplane, right, at x equals zero, then this x star is just going to be zero because it's zero over L. And so, well, that just leaves now I've just got the cosine of zero, which is one, right? Yeah, so again, this guy is just one. Um, and so I have one equation and I've got one unknown and I need to solve for that. So that's what I'm gonna do. So I'm gonna solve for the Fourier number. Oh, ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, so my Fourier number ends up being, oh, 3.8. All right. And then I also need to find T. So, thing that I had written in purple before. <laughs> so, this is equal to my thermal diffusivity times T divided by my LC squared. Um, and if you look back at the problem statement, they don't actually give us that thermal diffusivity, but they do give us enough information to be able to calculate it. Um, and so I'm gonna look at that right now. Let me go back to my problem statement way up here. I can see, oh, okay. So it's the stuff that I highlighted up there. Um, so from this, there we go. So thermal diffusivity, so this is going to be uh, uh, K over rho times our specific heat. So I've got all of those things. 48 is 48 watts per meter Kelvin divided by 7830 times 55 uh, or uh, 550. And I end up getting a thermal diffusivity of 1.115 times 10 to the negative 5. Um, and the units there are going to be meters squared per second. So now that I have that, I have enough information to plug that into the equation for my Fourier number and then calculate a time from that. I'll go down there. So I got my thermal diffusivity. Yeah. So my time ends up being... 861 seconds and I'll box that because that was what I was looking for so it's not a five it's a second 861 seconds all right so move on to the next guy oh not yet we're going to solve it using those Heisler charts Yes, I did interpolate for, for Zeta. Um, yeah, I didn't need, end up actually needing it. Um, but yeah, so this guy was my C1. And then my my Zeta, he was 0. 0.488. Oh, I did need him. I'm just kidding. 0.488 lies. Didn't need him. I didn't need him for the for the cosine portion though. Okay, so let's let's uh, go on to using those Heisler charts. So, oh, good. Perfect. All right. 
So remember, going back to the very beginning, I found my be it number. Stop that. I found my be it number. Right, find our be it number. And we had found that our be it number is 0 0.26. All right. And so now we're going on the assumption. And by the way, if you remember what we got from uh, that previous analysis, our Fourier number was 3.8, which is greater than 0.7. So it looks like that was a pretty good assumption to make. So we are going to assume that our Fourier number is the greater than 0.2 which means that we can use our Heisler charts. And our Heisler charts are really just, it's the graphical representation of that analytical solution that we already used with the C1 and the Zeta1. It's the graphical solution of the one term uh, temperature profile, right? The graphical solution of theta or over or whatever we're looking at, right? Whatever parameter, the temperature distribution or whatever, but it's just the first solution. All right, or first term in that solution. So we're gonna use our Heisler charts. Okay, all right. So if you recall, we do actually, well, yeah, so remember that we, we do actually have that theta star. We had calculated that already. It was the temperature at zero in that particular time that we're interested in. Minus T infinity over T initial minus T infinity. We had plugged things in. We had gotten this to be 0.4166. Okay, so we're still not using the series solution, but we are solving for this non-dimensionalized temperature profile. So that theta star, um, in this case, sometimes you'll see this is actually written as a theta star with a little knot because this temperature right here is defined at x equals zero, right? Um, and if you look at this first guy right here you'll see that's exactly what we have so yeah a little little blurry but that's what it is so this is we're going to be looking at figure 5s1 and the first thing that i'm going to do is i'm going to look over here at these all these red lines that are um, the inverse be it number so for this guy all right so i've got my inverse be it number this is going to be, need to make this a little bit less fat. <laughs> so this is going to be 1 over 0 0.26. Um, I've got 3, that'll be 3.846. Awesome. So I've at least got that. I'll know which red line to go to when I go to it. All right. And then I've got that theta star, theta star naught. So this one, this is our 0 0.4166, 0 0.4166. And you'll see that the numbers, um, they sort of like get scrunched up. And actually, uh, I need to go to this little cutout, cutout where they expand things a bit. So 0 0.4166, so I'm gonna go to that little cutout. And on this side, oops, now, the, all right, theta star not 0 0.4166, okay, and then our inverse, our, in, our inverse be it number was, uh, 3.846. All right. So. There's our three. Uh, 
looks like this is going to be four, that's five, that's six, right? So kind of close to the four. And then if I look at the if I look at the scale right here, you can tell it's not logarithmic. Um, so the way that I, I always do it is if you're wanting to figure out, so I know it's going to be, I know it's going to be between, so 0 0.41, so it's going to be between these guys right here, right? Um, and so the way that I'll do it is I say, okay, well, it's not going to be right in the middle or it's not going to be, it's not a linear scale, but the way that you can, so if this is, this guy is 0.4, this guy is 0.5, that's 0.4, this is 0.5. If I wanted to know, say, what like this little guy right here is, right in the middle, the way you find that is you say, okay, 0 0.4, or if, if you have a logarithmic scale, 0 0.4 times 0 0.5, and you take the square root of that. So let's see what that is. So 0 0.4 times 0 0.5 to the 0.5. So that's 0.44. So it's actually a little bit, if this one, that little dotted line corresponds to 0.45. So it's actually pretty close to that, that 0.4 line. All right. I kind of guess it's about right there. Although it's, I'm sorry, kind of awful here. So it's really close to that line right there. There we go. So, I don't know, maybe about right there. Uh, so that's close to, so one, two, four, six, I don't know, about 3.7, maybe. Um, and actually, that's pretty close. So that on the x-axis, that corresponds to your Fourier number. Um, it's pretty darn close. So for this guy, you would say, kind of, oh, right. So I would say, okay, well, I've done that. And now... With that Fourier number being equal to about 3.7, I know that's also equal to that thermal diffusivity times T um, over the LC squared, and then I can solve for T, right? And since with the with the previous exam or the previous way of solving, right, plugging it in the equations, I had a value of uh, a Fourier number of 3.8. I'm probably not going to find a temperature that that's much, that is that much different, right? Or not a temperature, but a time that's much different. Okay. So again, it's a little bit kind of kind of annoying to read those logarithmic um, scales, um, but if you're fine with it, this might be a nice easy way for you to solve those problems. All right. If you have questions, just yell at me. Otherwise, we'll kind of keep on. I'll keep on going. Okay. Alrighty. So problem 11. This a little bit fatter. All right. So we have a plastic coating is applied to uh, wood panels. Okay. All right, so here's the wood paneling. Okay.
All right, and then here's our polymer. Make it kind of pretty maybe. Okay, there we go. All right, and then we're subjecting it to airflow. So I've got a T infinity out here, and this guy is 25 degrees Celsius. At first approximations, the heat of reaction associated with the solidification of the polymer may be neglected, and the polymer uh, wood interface may be assumed to be adiabatic. So it's really the second part of that that's kind of important, right? This guy is an adiabatic surface, is what they're saying. Um, the thickness of this coating here, so between this, this guy, it is 0.002 meters. So 0.002 meters. Um, it's got an initial temperature, Ti, of... 200 degrees and we want to find want to find how long it's going to be until we achieve a safe to set a touch temperature of 42 degrees on the surface so that's the first thing that we're going to find so I'm going to call this a that's number one I need to find um, the time when the surface temperature is equal to, what, 42 degrees Celsius. And then the next thing we want to know, um, oh, and then they give us a convective heat transfer coefficient. This guy is 200 watts per meter squared Kelvin. We want to find the corresponding value of the interface temperature at that particular time. So we want to find the temperature at, uh, I'm actually, I'll just write at the interface. At that particular time. All right. Then we'll see what we need to assume here. Okay. Oh, and I've got some properties. I'll just highlight them because I don't want to write them. <laughs> but we've got a K value and then we've got a thermal diffusivity guy. All right, so this, this guy right here is our, that's our thermal diffusivity. Okay, so the first thing that I'm going to want to do is figure out, um, can I use my lumped capacitance method? So that's number one. <laughs> So number one, we need to calculate my be it number. And that will tell me whether or not I can use that lumped capacitance method. Because if I can, then that makes B really easy to answer. If my be it number is less than 0.1 and I can use my lumped capacitance method, that means that I am saying that at any given any given temperature or any given time, I'm sorry, any given time, the temperature is exactly the same throughout the entire medium. So, well, at that particular time that I'm interested in for part A, the temperature at the interface is the same as the temperature at the surface. It's 42 degrees. And so it, I've just really cut my work in half there. Um, but we'll see if I can do that. Probably not. But it's always worth a shot. Got to calculate it anyway, so... All right, so our B at number, H, uh, L, C over K. And before we start defining lengths and all that, I need to make sure that this is representative of the situation that's modeled here. So the situation that's modeled there and in the Heisler charts is this one. I've got a plain wall, and on both sides, 
I I expose it to some sort of convection. There we go. So here's x equals zero. Um, here's x equals l. Here's x equals negative l. Um, there we go. And so the question is, well, can I do that here? And the answer is yes, because right there at the surface, if you look at the surface here, we see that, well, we were treating that as an adiabatic surface. And so we can take advantage of thermal symmetry um, and model this, um, model it like this, right? We had done, we've done the same thing before, just kind of in reverse, right? Maybe we'd had this situation and we wanted to model it with an adiabatic surface right at x equals zero, y equals zero, whatever the case may be. So with that being said, go ahead and put this in pink and this in pink and well, now I have to color the rest of it. I'm sorry. It just, it has to be done and I'm very sorry about that, but it just has to. Otherwise it's going to annoy me the whole time. So just, just bear with me. There we go. Beautiful. Just beautiful. Sorry, it's taking a little longer than I thought it would. But still, very important work that we have to color in our, our model. Okay. All right. So now we can calculate. Now we know what that LC is. Yes, an artist. Yes, I can color. All right. So our LC is pretty obvious now. It is the point zero zero two. We might have decided that we were going to put that any anyway, but yeah, now we're really going to do it. So, all right. So now this becomes uh, 200 watts per meter squared Kelvin times our LC, which is the 0 0.002 meters divided by our thermal conductivity. That was something that was actually given to us, I believe. Yep, that's the 0.25 number. So 0 0.25 and it's watts per meter Kelvin. Perfect. And not surprisingly, <laughs> it's not going to be less than 0.1. It's going to be 1.6. So, okay, well, be that as it may. So our be it number is greater than 0.1. So we have to say that temperature is a function of position and time. That's fine. So I'll throw that up there. All right. And maybe I'll write the word only because I don't know that that sounds good, right? It's not a position. It's not a function of uh, position in the Y and the Z direction either. So there you go. All right. Perfect. So I think the next thing I'm going to do is I will I gotta use my use my equation there. So I'm gonna use that that equation that I've got circled um, that we used last time. Again, I don't know the time, so I cannot calculate the Fourier number yet. However, what I can do is I can say, well, I am assuming. So assuming that Fourier number is greater than 0.2. And then I'll go back and verify that later. But assuming that, I'm going to use the one term solution. All right. So I'm going to need to get theta, or theta star rather. All right. So my theta star, so that is the temperature um, at the position in time that I'm interested in. So I am interested in the surface temperature. So this is the temperature at x equals L. And then again, this particular time that I'm interested, that I, that I want to find out, right? So it is at L T minus T infinity over T initial minus T infinity. All right, so now I've got numbers that I can plug in there. So this is going to be 42 degrees Celsius. Um, T infinity was 25 degrees Celsius. T initial, 200. 
and then 25. The degrees Celsius are going to cancel out. It's even bothering me now not seeing the degrees Celsius, but it's okay. Um, I end up getting a value of 0 0.097. And then I know that that is equal to C1 e to the negative zeta 1 uh, squared times our Fourier number. All right, so there's one term. And then my other term is our cosine of zeta 1 times this x star. Awesome. Okay. So. Now I need to go figure out what the C1 and the Zeta1 is. So my, my B at number is point is 1.6. So I'm going to go to table 5.1 and then I'm just going to interpolate between 1 and 2. All right. So I end up getting by C1, I've got, well, I'll do the Zeta1. Zeta 1, I've got 0.99, and then C1, I've got uh, 1.155. So, perfect. So, let's plug those guys in. Okay. This is uh, 1.155 times E. I'm going to zoom in here just a little bit. E to the negative, and it's 0.99. So 0 0.99 squared times my Fourier number. And remember, that's my dimensionless time. If I solve for the Fourier number, I'm able to solve for the time, which I'm interested in. Um, so that's this one. So that's the time component portion of the solution. And then we've got the position portion. So it's going to be the cosine. And all right, so I've got 0.99. And remember... This x star, this is equal to x over L. Well, our x, we are talking about the temperature at L. So L over L, so just 1. All right. And then, of course, all of that is equal to my point. 0 0.097. So I'm going to put that on here. 0 0.097. So I have one equation. I've got one unknown. And so I need to solve for my Fourier number. So my Fourier number is equal to thermal diffusivity times the time that I was interested in over my LC squared. I think the thermal diffusivity was in there. Um, oh, <laughs> I'm skipping to skipping to the chase. I do have a value for Fourier, uh, the Fourier number. So it's 1.914, 1.914. There we go. So why in the previous problem did we do cosine of zero and in, in this one we did cosine of 0.99 and one? Because in the previous problem, when we calculated theta star, it was at the midline, right at x equals zero. So then this guy would be zero over L, right? Okay. Yeah. So that theta star is going to be any value from zero to one depending on where you are in the medium. Um, Is our, there ever a, uh, a reason why we write uh, x star rather than just x over L? Is it just easier to write x star? Or will it change to be like it's, r over or x over r or something? No, 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 no. Yeah, that's just a, the way it's defined. If you'd rather just not write x star and you want to write x over L, that's fine. Okay. Yeah. Cool. All right. And then we get to find T. Um, so I end up getting, we, ha we have the thermal diffusivity that's given to us. So I have a T, a time of 63.8 seconds. Perfect. 
perfect. So that's part A. All right. And then part B, now I need to figure out, they asked, okay, well, what's the interface temperature? Remember that? So we wanted to find the interface temperature at this particular time. All right, so now, well, now I know that time. That time is the 63.8 seconds. Oops, I'm so sorry. There we go. So 63.8 seconds, and it's the temperature at the interface. And if we think about like our model, that interface, so it's right there right there, right at x equals zero. So we are looking at the temperature at x equals zero and a time of 63.8 seconds. We're gonna go do that. Okie dokie. All right. All right, so we're gonna find T at the interface at X equals zero and 63.8, perfect. So I'm gonna use the same thing again. I've already, by the way, I'll just put a little yay a number is greater than 0 0.7 so the one term solution is okay <laughs> I'll say it's good okay so I'm gonna do it again wait is it 0.2 or 0.7 why did I write 0.7 where did 0.7 come from in my head I have no idea Anna I got nothing. Got nothing. Absolutely nothing. It is point two. Yes. Can't think of anything. I don't know where it came from. Okay. But anyway, yes. Greater than point two. So we can use the one term solution. So I need to find, I'm going to use the same one term solution, but now I'm going to be finding this, the temperature at this particular place. All right. At X equals zero. So I'm going to calculate my theta star again, except this time I'm looking right at x equals zero. So again, t at x equals zero, 63.8 seconds, minus t infinity over t initial, minus t infinity, right? And I know some of this stuff, right? I don't know the thing I'm trying to solve for, of course, but I do know T infinity, uh, 25. And I know T initial, 200. So at least there's that. And then I'm gonna use that same equation again. This is, this is equal to Z one E to the negative theta one squared times our Fourier number times our cosine of um, theta one times our x star. So because the time, we're, we're, we're still talking about that same time, 63.8 seconds, um, the Fourier number is still gonna be uh, 1.914, uh, that zeta is still going to be 0.99. So this term right here and this term right here will not have changed. Um, of course, the C1 is still going to be the 1.155. 1 um, the only thing that will have changed is the cosine term because now we're looking at x equals zero. And so because that x star equal to x over l and we're talking about x equals zero this is just zero perfect so i'll write the numbers out again just so it's really obvious but again it's the same numbers 1.155 1 uh, e to the negative 0 
squared times our Fourier number. It's still going to be based on that time of 63.8 seconds. So uh, Fourier number is still 1.914. And then I have cosine of zero, which is just one. And so now I'm going to solve for that temperature. So at zero, x equals zero, 63.8 seconds, I end up getting a value. Fifty one point eight. Perfect. And so I'll box that guy. That was part B. This is part A. Right. All right, so we will solve the same thing, but we're going to use the Heisler charts now. So just yell at me if you need me to scroll up or anything. Otherwise, I'll go ahead and move on. Okay. Delete you. Put you there. Perfect. Okay. So, I'm going to scroll down just a tiny bit. Okay. So, first thing I'm going to do, remember I wanted, I wanted to find, so I'm going to start with that. So, I want, I want to, number one, I want to find uh, I want to define the the temperature, so A, or the time. I wanted to find the time when the temperature at the surface at X equals L, and that particular time was equal to 42 degrees. And then I also wanted to find the temperature uh, at, the, at X equals zero, and that particular time, right? I.e., um, when when the temperature at L is equal to forty-two degrees Celsius, right? Same thing. So I'm going to start by I'm going to do the same thing. I would I would say, okay, well, number one, me find a couple of things. I am going to, number one, I'm going to find uh, the be it number. And we had gotten that our be it number was equal to 1.6. Can't use the lumped capacitance method. That's fine. Um, and let's go ahead and get our inverse be it number because I remember that was something that might have also been useful on our on those Heisler charts. So my inverse be it number ends up being 0 0.625. So 0 0.625 okay um, and then let's see what else we can do. Um, maybe that's about it. So I'm gonna I'm actually going to look at what I've got here. So on the chart that we used the last time, again, it's kind of ugly, I know, but I do know this one. So I know that that inverse B at number we said is 0 0.625. I'm looking for a time. I'm looking for a T time. Um, and so I'm going to need to eventually get that Fourier number. Um, so let's look at this guy. So this guy, I've got a couple of things there. I've got the theta star, but remember this theta star naught is at the at the midline, and I don't know the temperature at the midline. That's what I needed for part B. 
Um, so I might have to kind of work backwards here. I'm going to go to the next little Heisler chart over here, see what I've got. All right. So I have the temperature distribution in a plane wall of thickness 2L. Okay, that's totally what I've got. And then you've got these sort of swooshy lines. Um, and because uh, with part, uh, yeah, for part, uh, well, no, for part A, I was interested in the surface temperature. So I don't know. Maybe. Maybe we'll look at this guy. That guy right there. Because along that line, X over L, that's going to be right at the surface, right? All of this is going to be at the surface. And then, oh, down on the, on the X axis, this is our inverse B at number. So this was the 0 0.625, 0 0.625. And it looks like I'm going to be able to read off some stuff up here, which will be useful, right? Because, well, let's look what I have. Let's look what I have before we start plotting stuff. So I'm looking at the temperature at the surface at a particular time. So this temperature is the temperature at the surface at this particular time. I don't know what the time is, but at this particular time. And this guy is the temperature at the mid at x equals zero at that particular time. Okay, cool. So this is gonna be this is gonna be um, the temperature at the surface. 42 degrees Celsius. Then I've got T infinity, so 25 degrees Celsius uh, over T naught. I don't know him. I'm going to find him out. Uh, minus 25 degrees Celsius. We don't have to use. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Alex, I'm the same way. I don't particularly like him. You don't have to use these. You could just plug the numbers in and, and be, be happy with that. But you may decide you like the Heisler chart, so here we go. So if you if you decide you don't want to use them, just tune out for a little bit, and then we'll come back in a minute to 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 do the other analytical solution. Okay, so I know my B at number was 0.625, so I know. I think I need to a little bit. So that's going to be if I zoom in here, 0.625. Well. That's going to, here we go, that's going to be between this guy and this guy. Um, so if this is 1, that's 0. 0.5. Now the question is like, well, where's the 0. 0.625? Is it where I think it's going to be? And that little trick about, well, what is... What does this one correspond to? Oops, not that one, but like right in the middle. So I'm going to do 0 0.5 times 1. I'll do the square root of that guy. So point seven oh seven zero point seven oh seven. Yeah. Oh, know if I can. Yeah, but that's that's that one. So it's going to be a little bit to the left of that. I mean, I can try to get a little bit, even a little bit better. So like, what's this one? Well, going to be the square root of 0 0.5 times 0 0.707 whatever that is. I've got point, uh, point 0.6. 0 0.6. So I guess it's, you know, it's kind of close to that point 0.625. So I would say maybe just like a little bit, just a hair bit to the right. So I'm going to draw a line up here. Bup, 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 bup. 
right there and then and then I would draw a line all the way over here you could see well I could see that it's well wait. actually wait a minute my this isn't quite so good and good gracious like kind of okay okay <laughs> So it looks like that would make this this value right here this would be 0 0.55 yeah so if that's 0 0.55 then I should be able to solve or um, should be able to solve for t not so that's what I'm gonna do So solve for T naught. And that T naught is equal to the temperature at X equals zero and whatever time, whatever the time is when the surface temperature is 42 degrees Celsius. Um, so this is gonna be, uh, it's gonna be uh, 42 degrees minus 25 degrees Celsius divided by 0 0.55 uh, plus the 25 degrees Celsius, right? So I just, I, I took this guy and equated it to this guy and solved for T naught. Um, so I end up getting a value of 55.9. So that's the answer for B. Yeah, that's the answer for B. If you if we plugged in numbers, remember we got a value of something pretty close. We got 51.8. So it's in the ballpark. Yeah. Um, and now that we have that number, now we can go back to that first Heisler chart. And we could maybe plug things in and get a Fourier number and then solve for the time uh, solve for the time. So okay, so we had figured out the temperature at the midline at this particular time that I'm interested in is 55.9 degrees Celsius. So okay, that means this is equal to 55.9 degrees Celsius minus T infinity 25 over T initial. 200 minus T infinity 25. Um, you do have a number for that. I've got 0 0.155, 0 0.155. Um, and so now armed with that value right there of 0.155 and we'll have to have to go up a little bit. Um, and the fact that our B it number is um, that 0.625 or the inverse be it number is 0.625. I'm going to zoom on over here. Okay. So inverse be it number 0 0.625. This theta not star uh, 0, 0 0.155. Yep. 0 0.155 so that's clearly going to be between this guy and this guy but where is it going to be so this line that's halfway through or halfway up there um, right in the middle would be well it's a logarithmic scale you can see because it's not linear so that one would be I'll put it in green would be I'd have a 0 0.1 times a 0 0.2 square root of that guy Let's see what I've got 0 0.1 
Point one times point two, then uh, square root. So point one four one. Zero point one four one. That's that guy. Um, I'm at point one five five, so a little bit over that. I mean, I can try to get a little bit better, but if I've got a B at number of point six two five, that's gonna be. Uh, maybe about right there so that's going up like this yeah it's a little over that so i would say our fourier number i mean it's it maybe is a little less than two but i would say still our fourier number is about two and if that fourier number if that fourier number is equal to your thermal diffusivity oops, thermal diffusivity times the time over lc squared you can solve for that time i've got a time of 66.6 .6 seconds that's the answer that you would have gotten for a yeah kind of close kind of close um we had gotten 63.8 seconds before so all right if you don't want to use it you don't want to use this method you just want to plug in numbers be my guest again if you want to use it if you like those charts please feel free to do so just make sure you print them out and mark them up and send them to me okay I got questions we have one more problem and it's not as long as this past ones Okay. Whoa. Really zoomed in there. All right. So the strength and stability of tires may be enhanced by heating both sides of the rubber. And then we're given some parameters there. K, thermal diffusivity, in a steam chamber in which the temperature is 200 degrees Celsius. So when we say tires, we're probably thinking, oh, cylindrical. But we're looking at... Um, if you if you unfurled that rubber, that's what we're looking at. That's what we're looking at. So we have the rubber and and then we'll make it into tires, but we've got a sheet of rubber and uh, we have we are exposing either side of it. I had a question about this. Yeah. So with these kinds of problems, especially if there isn't an image attached to it, I feel like it'd be kind of easy to maybe think that it was talking about it in like a radial situation. <laughs> Would it be pretty clear on the exam? Yeah, I, I won't. Uh, yes, I, I won't try to trick you by talking about something that sounds like it might be a cylinder and then have you... <laughs> Have you model it as a as a plane? Yeah. Um, give me just a second. Let me look at the. Let me look at some of the questions that I did. Mm -hmm. Make sure I'm not I'm not lying to you. That was over here. Too many monitors. Yeah, it's it'll be obvious. I'm sorry. I know that was a long time for me to answer, but it will be obvious. Yeah. Very good. I appreciate it. Thank yep. <laughs> All right. So I've got T infinity. I've got H. 200 watts per meter squared kelvin same thing going on over here um got some properties let me go ahead and define this guy so here's x equals zero here's l negative l um this thing is 20 millimeters thick so l is going to be 0 0.01 meters um Taken from an initial temperature, so Ti, 
of uh, 25 degrees Celsius to a mid plane temperature of 150 degrees Celsius. So I don't know um, how long it's going to take for it to get to that. Um, but it's at the midline. So X is equal to zero and T is equal to some time. Um, and that's 150 degrees Celsius. And we want to find how long. So we want to find that time. How long did it take to get there? Um, as always, start by finding that B at number. Maybe you get lucky. You might get lucky, right? Um, yeah. If you didn't, I will say this. If you, if it was a problem where the B at number was less than 0.1, but you neglected to even check that and you just considered spatial effects anyway, I'd still give you credit for that because technically your, your solution would actually be more accurate. You would just be putting a lot more work on yourself. So yeah, so if you if it was a problem where the B at number was less than 0.1 and you could use the lumped capacitance method to make your life easier, but you didn't, um, and you use the other method correctly, okay, perfect, but uh, yeah. So, all right, so our B at number is H, L, C over K. We've got an H, we got an L, C, we've got a K in our problem statement. So there's our K, there's our thermal diffusivity. I'll go ahead and I won't write down the numbers. I'll just give you the number that I end up getting. I've got a K or a uh, B at number of, 14.3 so definitely definitely can't use the lumped capacitance method so I have to say that the temperature is a function of position as well as time all right I don't know the time so I got to make an assumption about that Fourier number so yeah let's go ahead and do that so assume that that Fourier number is greater than 0.2 and now we're going to start plugging in some numbers. So I've got my theta star. Okay. Um, and because we're looking at the temperature at the mid plane, I could call this theta star a little knot if I wanted to. It doesn't really matter. You don't need to put it there. But I'm looking at T at X equals zero and some particular time minus T infinity over T initial minus T infinity. I know all those values, right? Um, my, here we go. So it's 150 minus 25. No, I'm sorry. 150 minus 200. Minus 200 over the initial temperature, 25 minus 200. And I've got a value of 0.286. 0 0.286. Perfect. Um, so now I'm going to use that one, one term solution, right? So one term solution, which I can do now. All right. And so this one is going to be C1 e to the negative zeta one squared times our Fourier number. Oops. And then it's going to be cosine of zeta one times x starred. But I know that this x starred, remember he's x over L, and we're interested in the temperature at x equals zero. So, well, x star is just gonna be zero. Zero over L, zero. And so this whole term right here is just gonna be one. So simple, so simple. All right, I do need to calculate, or I did need to calculate that be it number to, to pull um, the constant and then the zeta value off of my chart. So yeah, I do need to go over to table 5.1. Uh, look at the values for a plane wall. I'm looking at thir uh, 14, 14 something. So there we are. So I'm looking between 10 and 20. And I need to interpolate. So 
Yeah, going to be kind of in the middle there. You can see those numbers start start getting closer and closer together there. Um, so I end up getting uh, what do I have? <laughs> All right, so I've got a zeta of 1.458. And a C1 of 1.265. So let's go ahead and plug those guys in. All right. So again, this whole thing, which is equal to 0.286, is equal to uh, my C1. C1 is the 1.265, 1.265. And then it's e to the negative zeta squared. So negative, um, oops, negative. 1.458 this guy is squared times the t uh, oops I'm sorry times the Fourier number that I'm looking for because I need that to get the time and then of course that whole second spatial dependence term is just one um, and so now I just need to solve for my Fourier number so I end up getting a Fourier number of 0 0.7. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe that's where the 0 0.7 came from, Hannah. <laughs> I don't know. But 0 0.7. And then this is thermal diffusivity times the time that I'm looking for divided by LC squared. So now I can find that time. And I get a time, and I did. I was given the thermal diffusivity in this guy, I believe. So um, the time is 1,100 seconds, and that's my answer. And if you want to use the Heisler charts, you can. It won't take that long. I'm gonna go through that really quick, and then and then we'll call it. And then tomorrow we'll start talking about cylindrical coordinates. Okay, so that one, okay, so the only thing that I need actually is this table 5S1, so I knew what my B at number was, so my B at number is something. Do I have it? I don't know. All right. So my B at number was the 14, 14 number. So 14.3. Yeah. So then this. Stop it. Stop it. This guy is going to be one over 14.3, which is. Point. Oh, gosh. Point. Yeah, point, uh, zero, point zero seven. Point zero seven. Okay. Um, and so now do I'm going to be looking for a Fourier number. I'll be looking for this guy over here on the X axis. So let's see if I can figure out this thing on the Y axis. So this is the temperature at X equals zero. I know that, don't I? Yes, I do. Um, in fact, this is the thing that I already calculated. This was 0.286. Yep. Zero 0.286. Um, and it looks like I'm going to have to go up to that, uh, that little guy up here, which is fine. That's fine. So I'm looking at... 0.286. So 0 0.286. Um, I'm looking at an inverse B at number of something real small, 0 0.07. Um, oh gosh. So that's going to be kind of uh, actually that's 0.1. So like, I don't know, somewhere in there. Somewhere in there. Kind of somewhere near um and i could try to gauge about where that 0.286 lies i know it's going to be between these values here 
this guy and this guy. So maybe, well, let's see, halfway through, 0 0.3, 0 0.2, square root it. Mm -hmm. And 0 0.25, 0 0.25, so it's a little bit above that. Yeah. So, I don't know, for a number, like this guy, for a number is, I don't know, about point, point 0.8. We had calculated a Fourier number of 0.7, so kind of close. By the way, that 0.7 is kind of close to the 0.2, so if I if I wanted to put a note up here that that Fourier number, because it's kind of close to the 0.2 cutoff, let me go up here, kind of close. to the cutoff of a Fourier number greater than 0 0.2. If we really needed to be accurate, maybe we add a couple of more terms there, but other than that, that's okay. So I'll kind of zoom in on this little guy real quick, just so you can maybe make some notes if you, if you like those Heisler charts. Anybody like the Heisler charts? There's a couple of people in, in class today that seemed like they liked them, but <laughs> yeah, I, I was never a fan of them either, but you know, some people like them. I don't, they're rubbish. I like it. Rubbish. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. All right. So maybe I'll just go through them rather quickly tomorrow. I still want to go through them, but, um, you know, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> all right. Well, that's all I've got. If you do have questions, I'll stick around i know it's too many lines i agree um but i'll stick around i'll put my five minute timer on and if you have a question then just say something or throw it in the chat okay thank you you guys have a wonderful night all right thank you